As a topic or a discipline, thermodynamics has four laws. What that means is kind of like the rules of the game to chess. Uh, if you know the rules of the game to chess or the rules of the game to checkers, um, then you know everything there is to know about chess or checkers, though the interactions of all the rules can make chess quite a complex game. Um, similarly, checkers can become complex as well. So with thermodynamics, with its four laws, if you really understand them, um, then you actually know everything about thermodynamics, and it's just a matter of applying those four laws. Those four laws come fundamentally from observing the world around us, uh, and from that, extracting, 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 understanding, hypothesizing, eventually distilling that says every observation we've ever had is consistent with the following law, four laws. Uh, and then those four laws, once formulated in that way, can then be replied in a reverse to say uh, this is then our expected behavior in an unknown situation, uh, given that all of our previous occurrences and interactions with nature have been distilled into these four laws. We expect all our future interactions with uh, nature or the way things work in the world to also be consistent with these four laws. Now, uh, of these four laws, as a point of fact, only two are really important in what we would call classical thermodynamics. Uh, the zeroth law actually came along uh, as the last law. As you'll see, it's quite obvious, but you actually do need it. Um, but uh, it's a little bit uh, academic or pedantic, uh, I would say, though you actually do need it. Um, uh, you don't actually interact with it directly too much in, in thermodynamics. Um, the third law, as we'll also see, is uh, needed, yet uh, it's a bit rarefied, um, really only becomes important at uh, low temperatures, and by low I mean kind of laboratory cold, um, things approaching um, absolute zero or 10 Kelvin or 20 Kelvin. Um, so as a point of fact, in your actual use of thermodynamics, um, in most circumstances um, where you're engaging with classical thermodynamics, you don't even know about molecules or chemistry. That came along later. Uh, those came along in the 1860s, 1870s. Classical thermodynamics, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, which today still explains everything around us, uh, uh, the human body, biology, chemistry, uh, 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 classical physics. Um, you only really need two laws, first law of thermodynamics and second law of thermodynamics um, uh, uh, to, uh, that you're really using day in and day out. The first law of thermodynamics has two components to it. Um, one is the conservation of energy. This means uh, joules, no matter what you do, if you track the joules, joules are not created nor destroyed. Um, you might have a heat interaction, it leads to a work interaction. You might have gravitational energy that's turned into kinetic energy, but you can always track the joules and uh, 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 they always, uh, uh, like a balanced budget, um, jewels then don't get created or destroyed, they just get moved from one compartment to another. Remember, those compartments are theoretical. We don't touch gravitational potential energy, we don't touch kinetic energy, um, but uh, you don't create or destroy uh, jewels. So that's conservation of energy. Um, now, an exception to that, of course, is later in the first part of 20th century, nuclear binding energy and that type of thing, energy equals uh, mc squared. But that's not classical thermodynamics. Um, and in uh, a point of fact, unless doing nuclear reactions or things like that, the corrections for that type of mass energy conversion are very far out in the decimal point and are not uh, practically important. So even under practical considerations, thinking about how the world works, um, we can still use that joules are not created or uh, destroyed, conservation of energy. You might think that that's the first law of thermodynamics, but a subtle point is that's only half of the first law of thermodynamics. Um, the second half of thermodynamics is the interesting supposition that, that there exists an internal energy of a substance. So, if I get my pot again, and I ask what's the internal energy of the pot filled with water? Now, in today's molecular world, we would say that the water molecules have vibrational energy, rotational energy, kinetic energy. Um, uh, but uh, in classical mechanical world, we don't, uh, we don't have to think about all of those molecular aspects. We just have a substance water inside the pot, which is our system. 
And we say that it has an internal energy. Um, the more heat interaction we have, depending on the heat capacity of the system, the more positive heat interaction we have, well, the temperature goes up. Um, the more negative heat energy we have, interaction we have, well, the temperature goes down. Um, so temperature is an indicator of the, the, the coupled with heat capacity is indicator of the status of the internal energy. Um, but there is an internal energy. Now, why is that remarkable? Because if you were to say to a, a, a cave person uh, many years ago, look, I have a pot. And cave person looks at it and says, okay, great, you have a pot. And I say, well, it has an internal energy. I think about it that way. Person looks at you, cave person says, it's doing nothing. It has no energy. If you throw it, I'll give you a kinetic energy. If you drop it, I'll give you a gravitational potential energy. What do you mean there's an internal energy? Uh, well, what we mean is that based on the history of heat interactions and the heat capacity, there are joules. We can we conceptualize that as joules contained within the water in this uh, pot, an internal energy. So, the actual point of fact is the first law of thermodynamics has two aspects to it. Uh, one is conservation of uh, of energy, joules, and the second aspect linked to that is the supposition of an internal energy, which is related to past heat interactions and for which temperature is a leading indicator of its current state. The second law of thermodynamics, there are many different ways to uh, state it, many different ways that have been stated uh, historically. Um, at the end of the day, the second law of thermodynamics is simply with the observation that if I have something at high temperature and low temperature, system one and system two, um, then the natural direction of heat interaction is that something at higher temperature goes with a negative heat interaction, so to speak, loses joules, and those joules go to the thing that's at lower temperature um, uh, and get the positive heat interaction. That's it at the end. There are many ways to state it. Um, the, the, the modern way to state it is to formulate that observation in a mathematical framework called entropy. In that mathematical framework, which we'll talk about more, um, the change in entropy is equal to what we call the reversible heat interaction divided by temperature. And we'll develop that in more detail. But it's important to remember that we invented entropy as a mathematical tool to simply explain that when two objects are next to each other, the observation always, every time we've ever looked, is that you go from a system at high temperature in contact with a system of low temperature. We know that the high temperature system tends to cool and the low temperature system tends to warm. And we have a mathematical framework to capture it. Um, uh, uh, entropy, ds, equals reversible heat interaction divided by temperature. Um, that's one way to capture it. That's the way we'll capture it. That's uh, kind of uh, the modern mathematical format to capture it. But it's important to remember it's not a unique format. What's unique in here is the observation of the direction of heat interaction. We have two things that equal temperature. There are many mathematical formulations that can capture that. Um, and we're using a, a particular one, um, dates back to uh, 1850s, 1860s, um, and it's widespread use. But there are alternative statements um, to the second law of thermodynamics or equivalent statements. But they all go back to the observation of, of of the direction of heat interaction being tied to temperature difference between two uh, objects. The third law of thermodynamics, um, again, uh, it really only comes up if you operate at low temperatures, approaching absolute zero, 10 Kelvin, 40 Kelvin, 50 Kelvin. Um, but what it says is that um, entropy, absolute entropy, goes to zero as temperature goes to zero Kelvin. We need that as a mathematical statement because um, if uh, the change in entropy is the heat interaction, reversible heat interaction divided by temperature, well, if the uh, 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 temperature is going to zero, you would think that would explode then to infinity because temperature is in the denominator. But the point is the numerator, which has the heat capacity in it, um, we'll talk some about that, but the reversible heat interaction is tied to the heat capacity. The numerator goes to zero more quickly than the denominator goes to zero, um, meaning that the heat capacity of something as it approaches um, um, uh, zero uh, 
Kelvin, we don't have to have a very big Joule interaction, have a large temperature change. Um, and that's uh, important then for convergence. And you actually uh, observe that in uh, nature. Um, to explain it, we have to go to a molecular model and statistical thermodynamics and talk about quantum energy levels. Um, but the uh, 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 heat capacity um, uh, essentially goes to uh, a limiting value as you go to very low temperature, meaning a small amount of joule heat interaction, joule interaction, leads to a very large change in temperature. Um, and that's encompassed in the third law of uh, thermodynamics. By the time you get to 200 Kelvin, which by the way is very cold, even 150 Kelvin, um, uh, then heat capacity um, uh, doesn't have such dramatic changes with uh, temperature, and one can just talk about relative changes in entropy, which is mostly what we do if we're operating in the day-to-day -day world of near room temperature or plus or minus 100 Celsius around it. But if you do start to operate at cryogenic temperatures um, uh, you, to, to avoid this uh, a failure, a mathematical failure of temperature going to zero in the denominator, you need this third law of thermodynamics, and it actually shows up in observations in that uh, at low temperatures, cryogenic temperatures, only a very small uh, heat interaction leads to a large temperature change. And that's because there aren't very many quantum energy levels accessible um, and temperature is a statistic of the occupancy of those quantum uh, energy uh, levels. But for the kind of classical thermodynamics you typically do, you won't run into the third law of thermodynamics. You'll only run into the first law and the second law. Now, interestingly enough, the zeroth law of thermodynamics was the last one to be stated. It's interesting. Um, uh, since you already had the first and second and third law, well, if you wanted to put the most basic law, then you had to call it the zeroth law. Okay, so historically it was the, the last, but numerically it shows up the first in the list, zero. Um, and it's quite obvious, uh, which is probably why it wasn't his stated historically. But let's show what it is. If I have something at a certain temperature, let's call it 298 Kelvin. And I have something else that is also at 298 Kelvin. They're at the same temperature. Okay, so these two objects are at the same temperature. If I were to uh, put them together, would there be a heat interaction between them because they're at the same temperature? No, there would be no heat interaction. Now this law, is so obvious it's actually confusing, so bear with me on it. Now, I come up to these two objects, and they also then have no heat interaction. So you infer that this one also then is at 298 Kelvin. Now, what the third law says, if you bring these two objects together that haven't yet touched, because they're connected through, because you've already evaluated that this one's the same temperature as that one, and this one's the same temperature as that one, what the third law tells you is that these two will also have no heat interaction. They're at the same temperature. It's obvious, right? Well, yes, it is obvious, but temperature is a very interesting statistic or indicator of the direction of heat interaction. Um, it could be for another type of uh, um, uh, attribute that you're thinking about besides temperature. Um, just because these two objects have no interaction and these two objects have a, no interaction, if you're talking about some other attribute, not temperature, you can't be guaranteed that these two won't interact. That's the basis of the third law, uh, or I'm sorry, the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So in review, uh, uh, thermodynamics has four laws um, in, the, in as a topic or a discipline, and those four laws allow the construction of all of thermodynamics. Everything follows from those four laws. It may not be obvious how, just like how it's not obvious how the rules of chess can lead to a, a grandmaster player, um, but the four laws of thermodynamics lead to all of thermodynamics when applied and understood properly. And those four laws, there's the zeroth law that says if object A is a certain temperature, and object B has the same temperature, and uh, object B is at the same temperature as object C, um, then there will also be no heat interaction if you bring object A in contact to uh, object C. So obvious, it's almost confusing. Last law to be introduced. First law of thermodynamics, combination of conservation of energy, joules are neither created nor destroyed, and the understanding 
that an object has an internal energy tied to its past heat interactions, heat capacity, and, and its current state being indicated by a temperature or its current tendency to have heat interactions with other nearby objects indicated by a temperature. The second law of thermodynamics, which is that uh, uh, we know that with temperature as an indicator, some, uh, one system at a higher temperature, one system at a lower temperature, we know the, the, the sign on the heat interaction, which is that the higher temperature one has a negative heat interaction, and those joules show up as a positive heat interaction in the lower. So hot cools and cool hots when you put two objects in contact. And there's a mathematical framework, a non-unique mathematical framework for that, for capturing that. Um, uh, the mathematical framework that we use is called uh, entropy, and our uh, entropy is defined, the change in entropy ds is equal to the reversible heat interaction uh, uh, q reversible uh, divided by temperature t. And the third law of thermodynamics is that um, uh, as one goes to zero Kelvin, the uh, entropy, the absolute entropy goes to zero. Um, that really only shows up if you uh, are working at cryogenic temperatures, 10 Kelvin, 20 Kelvin, 100 Kelvin, where you only need a very small heat interaction to get a very large change in temperature. That's the observation. Once you get the things that are closer to what we would just call cold, like the Arctic or room temperature, um, uh, uh, then uh, um, you can really just use relative changes in entropy. So as a matter of fact, as a practicing person in thermodynamics, thinking about things day to day that are occurring around uh, a room temperature, um, thereabouts, or engines, hot things as well, one really only needs the first and second law of thermodynamics to explain observations around us typically. Akabu.